Um, but so this is the sperm Golag experiment to set up. What they've done is they had an atomic beam apparatus that allows um, people to uh, do things to the beam of atoms and uh, and that um, <laughs> help to figure out the properties of the beam. I think you might have seen in physics 4B about things like a charge to mass ratio. Um, the way you do experiments like uh, that determine charge to mass ratio is you get beam of the charge of the particle and you um, you put them in a magnetic field, you see what kind of circles they make and that allows you to calculate charge to mass ratio. Um, in this experiment, they are actually using neutral atoms, uh, silver atoms. And the main reason they were using silver atoms is, so, you know, uh, uh, theoretically it would have been the simplest if they used hydrogen atom, <laughs> but uh, hydrogen atom doesn't have the right chemical property to be used the same way beam of silver atoms can be used. Um, so, so, so they use silver atom, but uh, the goal here is that because the silver atom has one unpaired valence electron, in certain ways, the kind of property they were looking for is would be quite similar to hydrogen atom. So they could do experiment with the silver atom and um, infer the um, infer properties of hydrogen atom based on what they observed with this. And um, I guess simple. Description here is this is what they saw. And, um, and so, um, so they had a beam of neutral silver atom. So because they are neutral, if you put it in an electric field, it wouldn't do anything. Um, in a magnetic field, they had a reason to suspect it might do something. Uh, so this is a non-uniform magnetic field. And it's designed to exert a force on a magnetic dipole that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and, and they were looking for, okay, what kind of splitting will this magnetic field cause on the silver atom? And, uh, and again, your textbook ties this to electron spin, which is correct enough physically, but not historically. So <laughs> let me step back a little bit and uh, approach this uh, again from a more historically correct perspective. And for that, what I would like to do actually is to go to this article uh, from Physics Today, which is published by American Physical Society, that, uh, that gives a good overview of a stern experiment. <laughs> It's titled How a Bad Cigar Helped to Reorient uh, Atomic Physics. I recommend that you read through it. It's, it's, I remember reading it as a student and it was fun reading through. And it's a, a colorful tale of how, um, you know, so I am kind of come from a biased place in that my own training is in experimental physics, not theoretical physics. And it is my opinion that experimental physics is harder than theoretical physics, <laughs> and, uh, which may not be universally sure. Sometimes theory, uh, theorists think they are the smart ones. <laughs> um, and uh, some part of this story will tell you why experimental physics is often harder <laughs> than theoretical physics. So, um, so I'm not gonna actually read it through the whole thing in this session. I'll leave that for you. I'll stop at the appropriate places to highlight what Stern and Gorlock are looking for, what they found in their experiment and how they interpreted it at the time. So, um, so I guess, hmm, where should I start? So, oh, I think this clock actually has, uh, yeah, the uh, the <laughs> experimental setup for the apparatus. So maybe that's a good place to start. So what this is illustrating is the, the, the figure that you saw in the textbook section. It's showing the uh, physical stern Golak apparatus. You have a beam of neutral atom. They are made to go through, um, a non-uniform magnetic field, and there's a result that they found. And uh, maybe the first thing to do is step back and ask the question, what were they hoping to find? And um, what they were hoping to find is, they were hoping to test um, what 
what I think is quoted in the article as them saying, it's a nonsense of force. So this is the nonsense of force as they understood it. So um, force nonsensical <laughs> semi-classical model says that, so this is, um, I guess, so this is what we'll read in section 6.4, the Bohr model. So in Bohr model, what Niels Bohr hypothesized was that um, when you have a model of an atom with a nucleus, um, so in case of a hydrogen atom, it would be proton that has that is 1800 times as massive as electron. So quite all, nearly all of the mass of the atom is at the center. And he was suggesting that the way the electron is stably arranged with this atomic nucleus, so here's my electron, is that it's a set in a stable orbit. And the way it is stable, unlike the classical prediction, which would have predicted that this is gonna spiral in into the nucleus as the electron emits electromagnetic radiation. That's the classical prediction. And Bohr's nonsense was to impose this condition without quite as much justification as there should be, that as this electron orbits the nucleus, that it has quantized angular momentum. Its orbital angular momentum comes only in discrete units of h bar. And as a reminder, h bar simply means h over two pi. And he's setting this so that this n has to be integer. In fact, in this model, uh, n would have to be a positive integer because in Bohr's model, if n is equal to zero, then electron isn't really orbiting and, and, and you know all of this wouldn't work out. So, um, so n goes from one to and so on. So, um, so what we associate with the ground state, the lowest energy state of a hydrogen atom would be associated with the uh, n equals one state where the electron has um, the angular momentum of uh, orbital angular momentum of h bar. All right, so, you know, it's uh, sometimes it, it's uh, hard to find difference between the classical myth telling and uh, physical models, because uh, we like to look at the, you know, the Greek mythology as an example of myth, as uh, one of the first attempts at explaining our world, you know, where did the world come from? It came from, I don't know, decapitated the head of a Titan or whatever. <laughs> and <laughs> it's just not what we believe. Um, and the difference between the ancient myths and the modern models is that we follow the consequences of modern models. If we truly believe that an atom is made of uh, one charged particle, a positive charge, that is being orbited by a negative charge, there are gonna be consequences. There's gonna be, um, there's going to be additional predictions that wasn't originally part of what was model was trying to take into account. Originally, all that the model was trying to explain was the Rydberg formula. That somehow the Rydberg formula made sense if you made atomic energy levels go as minus one over n squared. And uh, Bohr's model, quote unquote, drives that back. And um, so that would be kind of the starting place for the model. But it doesn't, but there are other consequences that you can deduce from taking this model seriously and looking at this as, okay, I have an, a charged particle that's going in circles. Then what this begins to look like is um, a current loop. So, um, so what this becomes is you, you have something that is some sensor fashion is a loop of current. Um, and I guess if, so I'm gonna say my electron was actually going clockwise, that would make my current go counterclockwise. And if, if you think back to what you learned in physics 4B, when you have a current loop like this, then there are consequences that follow from that. 
One is, I guess, oh, this should actually generate a magnetic field. So from the view that I've drawn, you would have magnetic fields that, um, let's try to use my <laughs> right hand rule. So, you know, as your current goes um, uh, counterclockwise, you would have magnetic field that's coming out of the screen. So um, I have magnetic fields that's coming out here. And um, on the outside of the loop, I have magnetic field that's going into the screen. And um, if I draw the different view or side view, then it looks like this. Um, it, you have, so this is the positive stationary charge and my negative, uh, my current is kind of going in a circle that looks from side view this way. And um, I'm gonna say my current goes into the screen here and comes out of the screen here. And the magnetic field due to a loop of current that looks like that, looks like this. So as you imagine these consequences of a Bohr's model of an electron going in circle somehow stably around the atomic nucleus, you come to the realization that um, what Bohr model predicts is that an atom should behave like a magnetic dipole. This is the, the elementary model of magnetic dipole. So that's the starting place or motivation for the stern gollock um, apparatus. Because, okay, we have a model of uh, atoms that says atoms should behave like magnetic dipole. So we can do magnetic things to it, see how they behave. Um, under the imposed magnetic um, field and uh, see if that, see if uh, what we get experimentally matches the prediction of Bohr, which is that this ang orbital angular momentum is quantized. So the magnetic dipole, which is associated with the amount of current, um, the magnetic dipole moment uh, in terms of current, uh, if uh, you remember the formulas in physics 4A, the magnetic dipole moment is given by current times the area. And uh, if you have the speed of the electron, you can kind of get an equivalent value for current, um, number of, D, in some sense, DQDT and um, the area of the circle. And you can uh, come up with a value for magnetic dipole. And this would be an experimental prediction that you can test. If Bohr is truly right, about the orbital angular momentum being quantized, that would lead to the quantization of the amount of current that can, uh, it, it would lead to the quantization of this quantity, current times the area, because there are very specific allowed orbits that fixes the amount, the area that can be enclosed in the current loop. And there's the, some specific amount of current that's associated with that area. So that would lead to a quantized magnetic dipole moment. So, so it's a it's a prediction. It's not something that anyone that it's something that anyone had measured before or came up with this model. So this is a genuine prediction. It's not an attempt at explaining the world as we see it. So and and this again, this is what sets apart to the classical mythology from the modern scientific process. When we come up with a model, <laughs> whether it be the decapitated head of Titan or a model of an atom like this, um, we follow its consequences. And you know, with the decapitated head of Titan, we don't follow the consequences. There's no way to. But with this model, you can. And uh, Stern and Gerlach did. And this apparatus um, it uses this inhomogeneous magnetic field to apply a force on the dipole. Um, the way the magnetic field is set up, if uh, the magnetic dipole is aligned one way, it would uh, feel a force one way. And if a magnetic dipole is aligned the other way, it would feel the force the other way. So uh, what you might expect is uh, for, um, so if this was some classical arrangement with the angular momentum that could take any continuous set of values, then you might expect some kind of spreading of the atomic beam, but you wouldn't expect this bimodal distribution with one distinct value and a second distinct value. 
you would kind of expect it to be just generally spread out. And um, when Stern and Gorlock did their experiment, and uh, what they found is that, and there's a nice bit of a historical uh, trivia, not trivia, um, is that when, uh, when they did the experiment and after smoking the cigar that the story refers to, um, they, um, they discovered the, the well-separated bands of a silver de deposits. Uh, they sent this uh, congratulatory postcard to, uh, to Bohr. So this is the uh, postcard that's uh, in the story. And I think it's written in German. It's a beer, I think that's a we for German. I can't read it all. But what I will point out is this is their uh, picture of the silver deposit without magnetic field. So that's uh, just showing the atomic beam. And when they apply magnetic field, they see clear separation of the silver deposit, which they took to be evidence of quantization of angular momentum. So nice story. And I think if you think about it a little bit or you know, read through the actual story, <laughs> then um, I hope you will notice a bit of um, um, discrepancy between how your textbook um, treats the stern -like experiment and, um, and how this uh, description uh, and comparison of Bohr's model, how they don't quite match up. Because in your textbook, they um, treat the stern -like experiment as providing the evidence for electron skin. And physically, that is correct. But at the time of the Bohr's model and at the time of a stern -like experiment, we didn't really know about the quantum mechanical spin, which we'll talk about, I think, in about two weeks. So here, we are talking about angular momentum, and spin is also a kind of angular momentum, but we are strictly talking of orbital angular momentum. And um, it's to me, it's a beautiful how certain coincidences work out in a way that um, some of the misunderstandings in Bohr's model um, align with the things that Stern and Gorlach and all the other physicists didn't know at the time. Um, they all kind of conspire in such a way that they could, uh, uh, without making any mistakes, think of this as a directly supporting Bohr's model where the true story is a bit more complicated than convoluted. But let me point out the, the convoluted pieces and how the uh, misunderstandings of the time actually aligned up so perfectly. So here's the thing that's wrong about Bohr's model. So in the Bohr model, the ground state of atom like a hydrogen was assumed to have angular momentum corresponding to n equals one. Um, Bohr thought the, in the ground state, the electron should have angular momentum, orbital angular momentum of h bar. If you took any chemistry, particularly college level, you know that to be incorrect. The ground state, state orbital of hydrogen atom is the s orbital, and s orbital has zero orbital angular momentum. So in the true quantum mechan, in the correct hydrogen atom, the lowest energy state actually has n equals zero. And um, so, um, so the silver atoms that uh, Stern and Gerlach were doing experiment with, it didn't have any orbital angular momentum. Uh, what it did have were spin angular momentum. And if you look at the spin angular momentum, so, um, so I'm, so, okay, so let's uh, try to be more correct about this. <laughs> and so this is the uh, kind of incorrect semi-classical idea. Uh, more correct picture is that you would have a, a ground state atom, uh, whether it's a silver atom or whether it's a hydrogen atom. And in the ground state, the electron is in S orbital, which means, uh, which means um, the angular momentum is zero, no angular momentum. 
but the kind of angular momentum that the silver atom does have is the electron spin. And that electron spin, oh, sorry, that S is gonna be confusing because the letter we use for spin is an S. <laughs> um, the kind of angular momentum we could have is a spin angular momentum either um, pointed one way. So this would be the projection of the spin. It could be h bar over two or plus h bar over two pointing one way, or it could uh, point the other way. So the other projection would be uh, minus h bar over two. And one might think then, oh, so that could have given a way for Stern and Gerlach to notice that, um, the experimental result here doesn't quite match up with the Bohr's prediction because this is a Bohr's prediction. In Bohr's prediction with a hydrogen atom, so thinking of the orbital angular momentum, you might have had the orbital angular momentum of plus h bar, or you might have had the orbital angular momentum of minus h bar. The difference between these two is different from the difference between these two. Up here, the, the difference in the angular momentum is total of h bar. Down here, the difference in the angular momentum is a total of two h bar. So the kind of the separation between the two beams, you know, physics is a quantitative science. <laughs> We're not just satisfied that the, seeing the qualitative view of, oh, there's a separation. We want to match up the separation to what should be the magnetic dipole moment of the thing and, and you know, calculate it out. And you might say, they should have noticed that this separation is half as much as what would have been predicted from Bohr's model. And it turns out <laughs> um, um, the, amount of the separation you get from the spin angular momentum or the magnetic dipole due to spin angular momentum is actually exactly the same from the magnetic dipole from the orbital angular momentum. And this is how they match up. When you, so uh, Bohr magneton is uh, the quantity that we used to specifically talk about the, the, um, the, the magnetic dipole moment <laughs> that's uh, associated with the, the orbital angular momentum. So that's the Bohr magneton. Um, there's a charge there, there's, um, and you can go through the derivation I want. And what's important to note here is that there's a factor of two here. It comes when you are going through the derivation. And um, is there, yeah. So, so yeah. So, um, so <laughs> without going into the actual quantum mechanics that um, that goes into actually driving this fact, let me just point out this fact. When you look at the spin angular momentum of an electron, um, the gyro magnetic ratio the ratio between the angular momentum and the magnetic dipole moment for a quantum mechanical spin angular momentum is twice as large as what you would expect it for a, uh, for a classical angular momentum. So, so this is a, um, well, G factor, that's the gyro magnetic ratio, I think. And yeah, and uh, this would be the place where they, talk about the, those two zero magnetic ratio. So when you look at the one for the, the orbital angular momentum, it's all what you would expect it to be classically. For the quantum mechanical spin zero magnetic ratio, there's this additional factor of two that um, takes relativistic quantum mechanics to predict. And that's the thing that um, they didn't know back then. So if uh, Stern and Gerlach had uh, matched up this separation against the predictions of the Bohr model, they would have seen that it matched perfectly. And um, so they wouldn't have noticed that, um, that the prediction of the Bohr model doesn't quite align with their experiment. 
So historically, this result is what, um, what was interpreted as providing uh, one of the first uh, evidences of Bohr's model. And, um, and as I say, when we, in the lecture, when we talk about the Bohr model, it's a semi-classical model. So, you know, <laughs> Bohr is right after all. They were right to, I guess they were more right than wrong to think of that, but Bohr isn't, was not completely right. This is the thing about semi-classical models. There will be places where they fail. And with the Bohr model, the key place where they fail is this incorrect assumption about the orbital angular momentum of the ground state. And uh, this can really only be corrected in the fully wave mechanical model. And while um, we don't have enough time to do that properly, uh, we'll look at the, um, I think in chapter eight, we'll look at the solutions to the, the hydrogen atom or rather the electron wave function for the hydrogen atom. And in the fully quantum mechanical model, we can get nearly all the features right. Um, so so I'll, I'll leave that there. I guess there are a few things that I didn't quite get to. Um, I will just leave it here that the, the stern gorlock apparatus is a way that, um, way in especially upper division and graduate level physics, way we introduce some of the truly confusing ideas about quantum mechanics. And uh, there's one such thing covered in one of the simulations. And I think I'll be able to bring this back in a couple of weeks and actually go through some of this. Um, but for now, I'll just point out where that is and so that you can find it. Uh, you have to first turn off the HTML5 thing so that you can find this flash simulation. And you have to go through the workaround that I think I described some time ago so that you can run it. And um, when you run it, going through that imagined workaround, <laughs> what you will find is this is a simulation. And um, what this will help illustrate is the, some of the truly paradoxical ideas about quantum mechanics. I, I think I can illustrate this here, maybe briefly without too much explanation. So um, these are um, schematized illustration of Strangolak apparatus. So we are not really, um, um, we are not really, um, 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 you know, do, doing the whole description of the magnetic field and all that, and just uh, schematizing it as a way to select one particular spin versus the other. So the first magnet uh, uh, selects for spin up. And when we um, send the particles through here, we'll find that um, half of them are spin uh, sideways. <laughs> And then when it goes through the third filter, this is where classically you might think uh, nothing gets through because in the first filter, we selected for spin up. In the second filter, we selected for spin sideways. And when you come to third filter, you might think, oh, I already filtered out all the spin down ones. So there should be nothing going through spin down. But when you actually fire, this is what you end up seeing. Oh, yeah, they go through every once in a while. Um, so sometimes it's blocked, but every once in a while, they actually go through. And the numbers you will see once I, uh, let me make it faster. What you will see is that eventually about 50% of the atoms that go through actually come out with a spin down. But didn't I select, you know, filter all those out? What happened? Where did they get reintroduced? Um, so I, you know, where we are in the course is not the right place to discuss in detail, but the Strangolaga paradox is the one that uh, helps the people because the ideas of um, quantum mechanical angular momentum spin is I think the one that uh, does an excellent job of uh, aligning your intuition to one that's uh, correctly aligned with the quantum mechanics. And uh, I'll find an opportunity to bring this in um, because it's again a little bit outside of our um, curriculum proper. Um, but um, 
So I'll bring that back, but for what we went over today is the historical introduction of Sturm-Gerlach experiment, which was interpreted as giving support to the Bohr model. But once we understand the quantum mechanics better, it turns out it mistakenly appears to support the Bohr model. But, uh, you know, this is one where we say, hey, science is an iterative process. Bohr model is more correct than um, um, more correct than our previous understanding of atomic structure. And Sturm-Gerlach apparatus gives more than less support. So it's uh, more on the supporting side of the Bohr model than the other uh, possible interpretations.